because all, all the hopes that I have for doing multi center studies are always you know, dashed after I see how hard it is to actually have information systems talk to each other. And I think, um, you know, as we think about the future of clinical and translation research, more and more funders are pushing collaborations between different centers. But if centers, information systems, and clinical systems don't talk to each other, it's, you know, it's, it, it can be quite challenging. As many of you realize, even within, you know, trying to look at databases within divisions or departments. So, um, so Dr. Sim is a professor of medicine, and she's co-director of the uh, bioinformatics at CTSI, and uh, also founded a company too. A nonprofit. So, uh, it's a great pleasure to have us to take us through uh, where we're we going, where we are, and where we're we going, and maybe where we came from too. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> nice. nice, Peter. So this is going to be a very interactive session. It's going to be a discussion. It's going to be pretty high level because I know all of you are coming from different uh, backgrounds and have different needs. But I think we're all struggling with data and computers and how they could help us and why do they make life so freaking hard for us, basically. Okay. So it is about biomedical informatics. And I think part of the problem with informatics and all of this is there's just a tremendous amount of hype. Um, and yet there are things that you think should be done that aren't done and it's not clear why they aren't being done. Is it not being done because something's just stupid or is it just really, really hard, right? And what's possible and what's not possible? And then of course this is important for your career because to know what's possible allows you to really push ahead further. Um, and if you buy into too much hype, you're gonna you know, run up against rocks that you don't want to in your career. Okay, so we'll go over some of the buzz which you've probably heard about and you, you know, we can share our, our, exam, our uh, experiences of buzz also, but certainly for basic discovery, uh, you, know, you know, lots of the omics are very highly computational. Here are two quotes from a long time ago. Um, Peter and I just realized the last time I gave a talk to this group was six years ago, which is, what, three internet cycles ago. This is even older. Sorry, was the iPhone even wrong? Yeah, no, it probably wasn't. Yeah, we were just, you know. Uh, 2000, this is our D back in 2001. Um, frankly, one of the biggest attractions to the last word, which was a name for UCARE, which was the one before APEX, for those of you who may remember, uh, is going to be a boon to clinical research. And information will be accessible in a much more uniform and complete way. Peter tells me that some of you are working with APEX. Is that right? How many of you are working with kind of APEX data? Okay, so we are now how many years after this? Is this true? Was our D true? Correct there or no? And is that because he just got it wrong or because we're just, it's our, our fault? There's, there's something broken, right? There's something broken. Really uh, Transforming Healthcare in 2001, right? Nationwide effort to build a technology based information infrastructure lead to the elimination of both handwritten clinical data within the next 10 years. Well, well past 10 years, have we eliminated the uh, written, handwritten clinical data? Actually, we kind of have. What have we substituted for handwritten clinical data? <coughs> All together now. Cut and paste. <laughs> right? Isn't that true? How many of you are on the boards? Have been on the boards? Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of come on. There's a lot of cut and paste, right? So a problem there too. Big data, um, you know, big data analytics, right? We're gonna create a world where doctors will eventually be able to do a Google like query. Why can't we do that? Right? Is that something that's in the near future? Is this reasonable? Is this not? Is this hype? Is this not? Eric Topols down in San Diego uh, wrote a, actually a very nice book, um, you know, all about digital health, right? That's uh, sensors. How many of you have a Fitbit, Jawbone, that kind of thing? Sensors? No? Really? Huh? It's a hype. It's a hype. No, it's, a <laughs> it's a bit of a hype, but there's maybe some promise there. We can digitize the human being in high definition. Granted, we can you can you can uh, obviously get your whole genome sequenced, right? You can uh, there's a, there's a company just uh, called Wello, which now you can grab your phone and it'll do your heart rate, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, uh, temperature. Has a little spirometer attachment to it, so you can get your flow volume loop. I don't know why you want that, but that's now a commercial product. Okay, what's going on here? Okay. Uh, we can finally get the digital revolution to get to what's really important to us, okay, because it's always about us. So, you know, lots and lots of buzz, right? Lots of money going into it. Um, how many of you have heard of the Big Data the Knowledge Center? That's a big uh, 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 NIH investment now. NIH just appointed an associate director for data sciences. That's Phil Bourne, who was the editor of computational biology. 
Um, so there's a big push to it. There's a big push in academics, lots of new departments and programs. We're trying to start one here. We've been trying for a long time. <laughs> there actually aren't quite enough people trained to do it, but you know, clearly there's something going on here, right? There's money, there's opportunity, there's interest, there's an academic field. So um, you probably heard about bio and clinical informatics, and I just don't want to lay it on to uh, um, an era that you're probably familiar with, right? Basic discovery, T1 research, clinical research, T2 clinical care, T3, T4, however many T's you want, right? Uh, but it does span the whole thing. And, and the reason why I would say that is because informatics is the use of computation to understand and manage complexity. It's really not to manage data, it's to manage complexity. Data is just a signal for the complexity in our lives and in, in, in what we're trying to study in systems. And we're trying to manage that complexity using an extender, using a computer which is more powerful than our own brain, okay? It's to augment the way that we, that we can manage complexity. And we want to manage that complexity certainly from basic biology all the way up to, to clinical care, to systems of clinical care, to public health systems, right? Computationally, that's all the same thing. It's just things relating to other things. Okay, and how do we represent that abstractly and how do we manage that using computational techniques? That's really what it is. And so basic and bioclinical informatics is kind of a spectrum. You know, if you're really an informatics person, you would say those are the same things, but of course the domains are very different. So the talk that was uh, given just before I came in here, you know, I can kind of follow it, but that's not my area of expertise, you know. And so you <laughs> can't deep, deep dive too deeply into it. But computationally, you know, statistics-wise, they're, they're very similar. So some uh, uh, commonalities across the spectrum. Okay, um, you've probably heard about uh, you know about the kinds of things that we uh, do in bioinformatics, right? Genomics and predictions and so forth. It's representing this information and then uh, uh, and then computing on it. Uh, examples of translational uh, informatics, as you see here. This is probably nothing new to you. Probably, probably you guys have done this, right? You use algorithms in your in your work, right? You take a program off the shelf, stick some data in it, right? You look at it. Clinical informatics, uh, probably some of you are doing this too. Um, anybody working in decision support? That's a really tough one, yeah. What are you doing? Sure, decision making. Oh, okay, good, good. Um, Real-time outbreak detection, uh, there was actually an article just uh, last week about Google Flu and how it really doesn't work, which is quite interesting. Um, natural language processing type things, mobile sensors. Uh, there's a couple of groups now looking at Twitter posts and predicting depression based on uh, Twitter postings. Um, so a community level assessment of depression uh, burden and also individual predictions of depression. So lots of like interesting <coughs> things going on, right? Um, there's a notion of P5 medicine, precise predictive preventive personalized participatory, add your favorite P. Um, but it, you know, it covers a whole lot, right? And at this point you're going, whoa, it's, you know, it's, it's a whole lot. Um, and in some ways, you can think about biology relating to body distress, behavior, social networks, and societal conditions. Now, I think that's, this is not typically how we think about research and health. I think generally we tend to focus down. So can someone give me a clinical condition where all of these come into play? Where you really, to really understand the disease, you really do need to think about biology, body stress, social networks, and social Obesity, great. Any others? Depression. Depression. Others? Hypertension. Hypertension? Okay, good, good. What else? Some of the infectious diseases, uh, yeah. measles, mm -hmm. flu. Absolutely, absolutely. Lots of societal conditions, right? The anti vaccination people, that's a new societal one. What else? Cancer. Cancer. Okay. HPV, right? Cervical cancer. What else? So someone tell me one that isn't related to all of these. Appendicitis. Huh? Appendicitis. I don't know how societal conditions would affect that. <laughs> <laughs> or social networks. Uh, <laughs> availability of going to the ER. They wait and wait and wait and wait and you come in and interrupt you. <laughs> you know, so when I first started this, I was like, anyone else have another one? Congenital. Congenital, oh, lots of societal conditions there, too. 
you know, age of, of, uh, of the parent, um, uh, environmental exposures, right? Any others? <coughs> So when I first started doing this, yeah, we asked for like you know examples that went all five, and then lately, you know, somebody said, "Well, what isn't? What isn't?" Now, when we do research, we tend to focus on one or the other, right? You've got you've got your basic biomedical researchers here who are over in this building, then you've got the people who do policy and they're over in that building, right? And then there are people who are like clinical care and we deal with real patients, and we're off in some other building, right? And we all look at our own databases, we all ask our own questions, and it's hard, it's really hard to do all five of them together, right? But what kinds of questions might you ask if you could? What kinds of questions might you ask about dementia if you know, you've heard the, the one about the, you know, the nuns, have you heard the nuns study about dementia? That if you took their diaries and you looked at their average sentence length and average complexity of language, way early on you can predict where they're gonna get Alzheimer's later. Okay, so, wow, I never thought about that one before, right? Crazy signals, that could be like totally ridiculous. But you can ask questions you've never asked before. You can get signals that you've never had before, okay? So in the last talk, right, there was uh, the, the backup clinical research. It was outcomes of um, uh, uh, VP shunt uh, in people with hydrocephalus, okay? You, know, you had on their patient symptoms. Well, you know, how do you follow patient symptoms now? You know, right now, if you were, who, what's your name? Brandon. Brandon. How are you, how are you tracking patient symptoms in, a, in, a, in your cohort? Of, I have to go by what's in the clinical notes. What's in the clinical notes? And do you think you guys are pretty good? All of us are pretty good at writing down patient symptoms in the note? No. How would you get patient symptoms? Ask the patients, right? And how do you ask the patients? Do you bring them into your clinic every six months and give them a battery of 300 questions? No. What might be a better way to do it? Hmm? An open-ended question. Open question, that's good. Uh -huh. Sending out questionnaires. Sending out questionnaires. What's another one? An app. An app, like how? Like have them track their own symptoms. Track their own symptoms, right? How many of you are quantified selfers? You ever heard of that? No? <laughs> what do you think that is? <laughs> you see that quantified selfers. <laughs> This is a this is a, a movement that's uh, sort of started in the East Bay. Of course, it started in the Bay Area. Uh, it's uh, it's people who track everything about themselves. Okay, so your Fitbit. Do you guys know what a Fitbit is? Yeah. So what do you get out of Fitbit? Any really anyone here use a Fitbit? Obviously, there are other ones in the Bay. You track your steps, your um, sleep. sleep. Yeah, how many of you use like a diet app, like a MyFitnessPal kind of way to your food? Okay. Oh, yeah. no, for exercise. Exercise, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's hard. Have you tried these food ones? Yeah, they're, they're incredible. Yeah. 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 yeah, and then do you really care how many times? Well, you know, the quantified selfers track everything. Their food, their sleep, their exercise, their mood. Uh, they track, they track basically everything, right? And, and with that, they see patterns in their behavior, okay? And they're ones that get really, really involved. Um, so, so there are ways to, to get at symptoms and to get at reports, both actively. You can ask a patient, you know, do you have pain, do you have fatigue? You can track their uh, biophysical properties, right, your blood pressure. There are now uh, little nano tattoos that can track your electrolytes your potassium, your sodium, your acid-base balance. Okay, there's stuff that, you know, I mean, we don't need to bring people into GCRCs. Very soon we're gonna be able to track, you know, biophysical measures using a tattoo, using, you know, sensors. It's huge, it's really huge. It's not quite here yet, but I would say, you know, don't just keep thinking about well, I'll go to the EHR and go get the data from there because it's, it's really the equivalent of the lamp post, right? And looking for the keys under the lamp, like because that's where it is. So to me, there's a huge uh, sort of a, a, a tapestry of data out there, right? It's how you live, it's your symptoms during your life, it's how you eat, it's, it's your exercise, it's your mobility, it's your biophysical function in life. And what do we do? We take all that at that and we filter it down to the percent of people who come to see a doctor a year. Okay, so 
What percent of people see a doctor a year on average, out of the whole population? What do you think? Something like that, right? And what about the ones who actually like get into a hospital? Lower, right? And the percent who come to a hospital like ECSF, the tertiary care medical center? Yeah, is that a lot? Okay. And so out of that little little box on the bottom right, how much of the data of that person gets into the EHR? And you're using that for your research? You know, to me, it's like there's all this big picture and we're looking <laughs> <laughs> camera looking at the bottom right corner. And we're stressing about coding. That's why it's just backup project. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like we're all in the same boat. We're all in the same boat, okay? And so you hear a lot about EHRs. We're spending billions of dollars in the EHRs. We're spending all that in there. And there's all this other data for us to ask really different questions, okay? And, and I think, you know, it's, it's a big risk to jump that far, but, but really, I mean, that to me is the bigger picture, and obviously this is just my view, you guys can take it view. But, but I, I think, you know, put it in perspective, why is the EHR so important as a source of data for research? What question are you really trying to ask? And what kind of information do you really need? Question. Um, Garth is like the most relevant, the most relevant data to kind of try to collect as opposed to this huge swath of data that may not be for patients who are sick or, or suffering. I mean, if you have to choose one place, one source you get your data from, then this would be the ideal place. Um, whatever is ideal, whatever is relevant, depends on what your research problem is. So, right. for depression or for all the diseases we mentioned, mm -hmm. a huge proportion of population isn't suffering from those diseases. So, yeah. if you have to go somewhere to find data, which makes sense to go there for those that. Yeah, but I would go to the people with depression who are out in the community. I wouldn't go for the people with depression who are seeing us here at Lightning. Right? Yeah, so it, it's again, it just, it's not to say that there's any right answer, but it's to say, what is the question you're really trying to ask and what question do you want? And, and where's the best source of data? And, and in the old days, yeah, I mean, the chart was it, right? But now that's not really true, okay? There's a lot more. How many of you ever heard the term big data? Yeah, okay. So these are the, the four V's and sometimes it's five V's and sometimes it's six, right? Um, volume, loads and loads of it, okay? Even more blah, blah, bytes than I could, you know, zettabytes are right. Uh, variety, so structured data, so that's like a, you know, SQL data, you know, access database kind of data, relational data. Semi-structured, so that's just a little bit of fields and some, you know, some free text data. And unstructured data. Unstructured data is all the data on the web, right? So do you think Google has a relational database in the background? No, they don't. Okay, it's just a massive, there's no data schema, there's no data coding, it's just massive data, okay? And yet, when you put in a search term, they can come up with some pretty good stuff, right? So that's unstructured data. It's text-based data. How do, you, how do you analyze unstructured data? How do we analyze unstructured data in healthcare for biomedical research? We're really not exploiting unstructured data at all, and yet, all the big analytics that you're seeing with the commercial companies exploit unstructured data. Okay. So how do, how do we break out of just structured data and incorporate unstructured data? And of course, the EHR is a lot of unstructured data. Velocity, you've got um, data from the EHR, which is at a snapshot in time. And then you've got the streaming data, your geolocation trace on your mobile phone. Okay, that kind of stuff. How do we manage that kind of data with, you know, sort of uh, longitudinal snapshot data? And then uh, quality relevance, you know, all these things are, are obviously really, really important. Um, and, and this tells you, since it costs a lot to, to ensure quality uh, and, and meaningfulness, you better look where you really want to look. Okay, so to your question, you don't look at everything. You want to look very carefully at, at what, you, what you really need. And that just puts more premium on defining your research problem and defining your data sources even more carefully, right, even more carefully. So I want to go a little bit about what uh, informatics is, because it's a, it's a term that gets thrown around a lot. Um, so here's a definition, which is still a good one from the NIH uh, quite some years back. Okay, so we're going to step through this definition bit by bit. So um, research development or, or application of computational tools and approaches. So that's building and using software. And that's really what it comes down to. Okay. How many of you took computer science? Okay. How many of you program? Okay, so you don't, you don't need to know how to program, but you need to understand kind of what software is, right? But it is, this is about software, which, you know, 
many of us didn't do any of that in, 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 in medical school. Um, it's for expanding the use of biological, medical, behavioral health data. Okay, now, I, I, I highlighted expanding because computers are a tool, and you can use it as a tool to do what we've <coughs> always done. Right now, we can cut and paste a note instead of writing it on paper. Right, but it's the same thing. Right, we just took that paper and we put it like this. Right? Have we done much more to the chart, to the note? I mean, fundamentally, think about it. You know, back when we, we practiced like on paper, right? Uh, have we really done something fundamentally different with it? Or do we just take something we've already did and just digitize it? Okay, there's a whole step more that we can do, right? So if you think about, um, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the old days, it was like, um, uh, you know, if you got a car, if you ask people whether they wanted a car, nobody would say they want a car. They said, well, I want a faster horse, okay, a horse-drawn carriage, right? I want a horse that runs for longer. I want a more comfortable horse-drawn carriage. People don't come up with, I need a car where I can just turn, you know, a key and, and then and it'll go by itself, okay? That was a major shift. And so it's really enabling new uses, and we're not quite there yet. We don't quite know how to use the new things, but we're starting to, and it's you know your generation that's going to come up with that. So expanding the use, and this is the, the fundamental part: to acquire, store, organize, archive, analyze, and visualize the data. That's what we need, because that's what that's what we're asking computers to help us with. That's what we need to manage complexity and to understand complexity, and to ask questions that further our science. Right. So it's things that software will do to help us do these sorts of things for research or clinical care. And I would say going forward, I would urge you to think about research and clinical care as two sides of the same coin. That we do research, we do care, and one feeds on the other in a much closer loop than what we're doing now. Okay, and it's not we have that building and that building, but it really needs to come together. We're nowhere near that, nowhere near that, okay? The Institute of Medicine has a, 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 um, a report called the Learning Healthcare System. Um, I push for the Learning Health System because I don't really care about health care, I care more about health, okay? So if we're doing research, we should be doing care and research at the same time. Okay, we're doing, trying to find out the outcomes of people with VP shunts and hydrocephalus, we're taking care of them, but we're doing research at the same time. Okay, that we, our research comes out of our clinic. And, and right now, it's still very, very hard to do. Um, I think it's really challenging for a lot of us because it draws on fields that most of us, well, you know, we did all the pre-med courses, so it wasn't like we had a whole lot of time, right? Computer science, which is a big field in on itself, engineering is really important. Decision science, this is important for those of you doing decision support. Health management, boy, you better understand that if you want to know how to get data out of stuff and who controls the dollars and why the systems are set up the way they are. Apex, got to understand that. Philosophy, because it um, has a lot to do with what you represent. You know, what, what's truth? And how do you represent truth? And when, when is it okay to be wrong? And what does that really mean? So a lot, actually a lot of philosophy in artificial intelligence. Math, of course. Product design, those of you who want to build an app. Those of you who really want to impact the way we do this in supporting clinical care. Those of you who want to build a, a, um, a system for managing researchers. Okay, how many of you were at um, uh, Kate, um, Kate Rankin's talk yesterday? Was it yesterday? There was a, there was a, a, cha a chancellor's talk on research and Kate uh, presented on uh, a neural platform where they're bringing a lot of data together. This is precision medicine. You know, you've heard you said it's all about precision medicine. So, you know, her project is the sort of the, the, the poster child for precision medicine. And they're building a platform in collaboration with UC, UC Berkeley where you can have genomic data, imaging data, experimental data, um, all kinds of data come together sort of on a, on a, on a work, work, uh, workbench, digital workbench where you can share data sets and you can share annotations and you can share discussions among researchers that are distributed across the US, okay? There's quite a lot of that stuff going on, okay? Collaborative science is really, really important. You better know product design if you're gonna do that, okay? You better, because it's really hard to design a system that supports complex thinking. Ethics, privacy, right? I mean, we're tracking your geolocation data. Who, do, who should get that? What if it tells you, what if you can find that, you know, if you, um, you know, you can predict, you can predict maybe osteoarthritis or functional stats, right? I mean, that would be a good trace. 
you know, for, for a lot of stuff, right? But that's pretty invasive stuff, right? What if we can tell that you're always taking your lunch time and going off to a hotel, and that's the same time that somebody else in your office is also going off to the hotel? <laughs> <laughs> you think that's funny? That happens. And it's really, really, really problematic, okay? Uh, public policy. Who gets at this data? If we put all the EHR together, who owns that data? Is it you? Is it the hospital? Is it the patient? Who, who, gets to, who gets to make money out of it? You know, when you get a prescription, um, Walgreens gets that, that prescription, right? What do you think they do with that data? All the prescriptions that the pharmacy benefit management company has gotten. What do you think that data? They sell it, right? Do you know that they're selling it? Yeah, you do. <laughs> Good. Uh, they're, they're profiting on us. There are people who sell the EHR data for profit. We briefly thought about doing that here because it's extremely valuable data, right? So you want to be treated here at UCSF, you sign on the dotted line, we do research it, and by the way, we sell it too, to make money. Is that ethical? What do you think? It depends, right? Yeah, so the thing is, you know, can you really take your name off it? Is it really not identifiable when you have your genome data in there, right? Because sooner or later, genomic data is going to be there, right? So if you've got your SNP pattern, or you've got your whole genome there, I mean, we're, we're at $1,000, $10,000 for whole genome sequencing right now, right? We're rapidly coming down to 1000 for it. It's going to be there. Does it matter that we don't have your name and your record when you've got your whole genome sequence? So there's really no privacy. There's really no, you know, so huge issues there to think about. Um, let's see. Where is our, do we have a time check? Right now. Oh, there. Okay, good. So, um, these are the kinds of things that, that uh, uh, come into play for designing and using software. Um, basically, there's just a lot of it that is both technical and non-technical. Uh, the bottom line is biomedical informatics is designing and using software to acquire, analyze, and organize for, you know, for big data. That's really what it is, okay, to support and enhance our work. Now, how is this different from clinical IT? Because I hear this all the time, okay? Does Mark Larratt do informatics? No. Does uh, Joe Bedford do informatics or CIO? Okay, well, what's different between what they do and what quote unquote is informatics? Okay, because they're obviously not department chairs of informatics and shouldn't be. What's the difference? Um, the way I see it is clinical computing is using today's technology to meet today's operational needs. It's running APACs, it's making sure our network is in place and everything. Clinical informatics is, is the seeking the computational advances and insight. So it's the algorithms, it's a data representation, it's building software, you know, to really do the knowledge work. Okay? And we need all this. All right? We absolutely need all this before we can get here. And the frustration is, you know, we're still working on this. Right? We spent hundreds of millions of dollars, number one, to get our networking up to speed. We have to replace our routers, you know, for Y2K, that costs a lot of money. Um, and we're just we're getting Apex in, right? That's all basic, basic, basic stuff. And now that we have an electronic data warehouse, ooh, now we need to make sense out of it, right? Because we still can't get here because we're still working on that. And that's part of the frustration and understanding this distinction is actually really important. Where do you think all the money's going? In here, right? Because we're still here. Where is the expertise going? Actually, I'm not sure because there's just not enough expertise at all. Not enough people trained here, not enough people understanding what this is and how this relates to that. We're, we're still working that out on campus, honestly. Honestly, okay. So the big picture that I see is um, we've got patient care and wellness, okay? And we have raw clinical data and clinical care transactions, okay? So the raw data is like the potassium, your weight, right? And a care transaction, can somebody give an example of a clinical care transaction? Think business now. What's a transaction? What kind of transactions do we do? Money for services. Pardon? Money for services. Money for services? Okay. How about a clinical transaction? Yeah, a visit. Okay. What else? Lab test. Um, a lab test, an order. Okay. A procedure. Okay. A referral. Okay. Those are, those are all transactions, right? And we have clinical IT that supports that. So APEX supports transactions. Does APEX help you think 
about your patient. Does it? 